Yeah, okay, good deal. Well, um, it's 7 o'clock now, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and get us started here. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this farminar tonight. Thanks for tuning in. If you didn't hear Brooks already, he's curious if any of you are raising um, grass-fed, pasture-raised livestock and, and how you're marketing it. Put that in the chat box just so we kind of get a gauge on what the audience is like tonight. I'm always curious about where you're from, too, so if you want to share where you're tuning in from, please do that. Um, but yeah, I'm Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and I'm going to kind of uh, host this tonight. Um, so thanks again for joining us. And tonight, as you are aware, we've got Brooks Hitsfield from uh, Roanoke, Indiana at Seven Sons Farm. And Brooke is, I think, son number five out of seven. Is that right, Brooke? You Brooks? got it. Yep, yep. fifth in line, uh-huh. Right. Five out of the seven sons, or number five out of the seven sons, and he works on their marketing strategies, particularly their online marketing strategies, which he'll be talking about tonight. Um, seven Sons is a really successful farm, a really neat farm, and we're super glad to have Brooks here to share a little bit about what they do. Uh, he's got a ton of great content to cover tonight, so I'm going to talk about PFI quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brooks to, um, to share all that great information with us. So this is part of our winter farm in our series. It's the last topic in our series. We've been doing these since uh, mid-November. And uh, so after tonight, we'll pick it up again in mid-November 2018. Um, so if you missed any in our last uh, you know, 17 weeks or so, we do record all these. We're recording tonight as well. And uh, we've been doing this for nine years. And so we've got about 150 or so of these farm in our recordings in our archive. So go back through that archive and dig through, and you'll find something interesting, I'm sure of it. And like I said in the chat box there, we do have an a, um, a email list if you want to sign up for it. We might do some pop-up webinars this spring and summer. We'll send you an email about that and um, any other farm and our updates. If you, want to, if you want to get on that, sign up on that uh, email list there. So a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. We've been around for over 30 years. We are a nonprofit, member-based, farmer-led organization. We call ourselves um, a big tent because we welcome farmers from all enterprises, farmers that raise any, any kind of livestock, fruits and vegetables, corn, beans, small grains, everything in between, uh, farms that are big and small. We provide programming for uh, farms of all kinds. And our mission at Practical Farmers of Iowa is new this uh, 2018 year. Our mission is equipping farmers to build resilient farms and communities. And we do this with farmer-led investigation and information sharing, which is the way that PFI has been operating uh, for over 30 years. We've stayed true to that farmer-led investigation aspect. And we achieve our mission through a number of activities. Um, we, of course, do on-farm research through our cooperators program. We host on-farm field days throughout uh, the year, starting starting in March, actually. You can see our map of events there with our cover crop field days coming up in March. Uh, we have an annual conference in January. We do workshops. We're right now doing um, uh, beginning farmer listening sessions across the state. If you're a beginning farmer that has been farming between five, five to ten years or so, we want to hear about what your barriers are. Um, you can look up all of our activities at practicalfarmers.org. Um, of course, these farminars are a great way that we uh, that we do what we do with our farmer-led um, knowledge sharing. So plug in with PFI through any of these activities. You can learn more about them at practicalfarmers.org. And of course, as a member-based organization, we want to ask you to join us. So um, please uh, become a member. There's tons of member benefits, including discounts to our annual conference. You get our quarterly newsletters. Um, you can access our email discussion groups. Um, but Practical Farmers really is a network of farmers and friends of farmers who want to see a sustainable agriculture practice across the state and across the Midwest. So um, join our network of like-minded people who, um, who want to improve profitability and efficiency and stewardship on Iowa farms. And finally, a couple of rules real quick. Uh, definitely use that chat box um, for your questions for Brooks tonight. Uh, Brooks is going to be going through a lot of stuff, so if um, you know he might not see your question, but I'll make sure we get back to your question at the end of his presentation. So we'll have some time for questions at the end, um, but feel free to put them in the chat box. Try and keep it on topic because we'll be moving pretty fast and covering a lot of ground, um, and he might be covering a topic uh, a little bit later that you're asking about now. So, um, but do use the chat box, please. 
Uh, also, I want to say as a farmer-led organization, your feedback is super important to us. So there's a link right there on the on the screen to take a survey monkey survey. Give us a little feedback about what you learned tonight and give us some feedback about what you want to learn about in the future. And we take that really seriously and we try and provide programming, whether it's another farminar, whether it's a field day or a conference session. Um, let us know in that survey uh, how we're doing and what you want to hear about in the future. Also, you get a chance to win a PFI hat or shirt or something just by taking that survey. So um, please do give us feedback. It means a lot to us. Um, Another thing, if you haven't noticed it, on the very bottom left corner of your screen is a little poll that says how many people are attending via your connection. That helps us get a good idea of yeah, the head count here tonight. So um, if there's a couple of you watching from one computer, make sure to check the right box there so, um, so we can get a bit of an accurate head count about how many are tuning in. Um, please be respectful of other, others. Be respectful of our presenter. Um, if you want to sign up for our email list, I mentioned there's a link there. Um, I'll put this survey link in the chat box a little bit later, but you can click on that now and it'll open up and then you can take that when we're done tonight. But that's all I've got for my introduction here and so I'm going to turn it over to Brooks. Brooks, when you see your presentation up, uh, feel free to take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, and just to add a little bit to what Steve was saying there, definitely leave, you, leave me your questions as we go. Um, I want to try and keep this interactive. Um, there is a lot of content to cover here, um, so I might not get to them right away, but we will we will readdress those um, for the questions at the end. So anyways, um, so Seven Sons, again, there are seven of us boys here on the farm. My mother did give birth to, my poor mother did give birth to four boys, no daughters. Um, we've all been involved on the farm since, uh, well, from a really young age. I think most of us have been paying taxes since we we're 12 or so. Um, but we raise basically uh, some pasture protein products, grass-fed beef, pork, and poultry, and we direct market those products to a direct consumer base of over 4,000 customers. Um, and we've been doing this for about 20 years or so. So during that time, we've done a lot of things the wrong way. Um, but we have found a few things um, that have worked, and um, we think they can work for other folks um, as well because we pretty much tried everything else. Um, but yeah, as we've talked to, to other farms across the country, um, we've kind of identified what was our number one barrier to direct marketing um, early on, and we've seen some similarities with some other farms. And this is actually a talk that um, my older brother, Blaine, um, who also helps out with the direct marketing and distribution at the farm. He's given this um, quite a few times across the country. Um, so it's mostly inspired by him. Um, uh, but hopefully we get a few takeaways from this. I, I, I did ask the question earlier, but in case you didn't, you weren't in at the time, um, can you just let us know in the chat box how many of you are raising either grass-fed beef or pasture-raised proteins um, and how many years you've been doing it? Uh, maybe 5, 10, 15. We've been doing it for grass-fed beef. I think Dad started that about 20 years ago. So um, so back during that time, if you've been doing it for a while, you probably remember when this was was, was, uh, was the fringe. Um, and early on during those days, um, we didn't really have a lot of support from either the Ag Society or even there was hardly a consumer base um, for grass-fed beef 20 years ago. Um, so there was a lot of growing pains and struggles to work through and a lot of ridicule that we got even just from, you know, neighbors and, and farmer friends. Um, but even during that time, um, um, you know, during those early growing pains, we were still um, dead set on two beliefs. And belief number one was that grass-fed beef would eventually become known and accepted widely by consumers. Um, and belief number two was that when that day finally happened, it would be a great day for the small regional family farm. And uh, we were right about belief number one, um, but we were pretty wrong about belief number two. Um, this is a photo that we took um, in our local supermarket just about 15 minutes from the farm or so. Um, so as we've kind of seen some attention brought to this movement that a lot of us, you know, early on helped pioneer and bring attention to, we've also developed the attention of almost a, a new wave of industrialized um, agriculture 
who's um, coming in on a little bit of a, a piece of the pie. I think out of all the grass-fed beef sold in America, 90% of it is imported. Um, a lot of it's processed here, so it's labeled as product of the USA. 5% is raised in feedlots, and that that's, um, leaves just 5%. That's actually uh, truly grass-finished out on open pastures like ours. Um, and I, I give this example, but I think a lot of us can relate to this, whether you raise grass-fed beef or not. There's, um, there's a lot of shelf space. Um, we're seeing this, by the way, this is uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that's not a real progressive market. So we're seeing this kind of all over across the country. And this is shelf space that, you know, when we thought that day finally came and the consumer was aware what we were doing, you know, was going to belong to, to, to smaller regional farms uh, like ours. Um, and we, we, when we look at things like this, I th we, we kind of ask ourselves, you know, um, the term kind of is called greenwashing. And uh, we ask ourselves, you know, do we see more of this coming in the next, you know, five years or so? Or are we going to see less of it? Um, you know, this is a product that, that looks very similar to what we're doing. Um, um, but, you know, obviously this has brought us more noise and more competition in the space. So, you know, we, we try to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to continue to differentiate? What, in belief, what beliefs and strategies are we going to employ on our farms to make sure we can pass to the next uh, generation and continue to grow and thrive? Um, well, we do have one belief on our farms, and that kind of uh, changed everything for us. And that belief was inspired in a book called Farm Fresh by Alan Nation. In that book, he's quoted saying, the highest return for pure knowledge is, has been, and always will be marketing. Um, this belief has um, kind of become a motto for us, and it's what it's kind of what has um, um, you know for us. This is what has employed some of the strategies that we've employed on our farm to allow ourselves to position ourselves um, a little higher in the food chain. And it all it all is is determined on how we go about our marketing. There's a lot of value to be captured. Um, and the food chain, in the value chain, there's a lot of value that's captured from the, you know, a short time period when product leaves our farm and gets in the hands of the consumer. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, this is a small slide that shows the percentage of the food dollar that goes to the farmer. And I think this is over about 50 years or so. That's not a decline that looks real promising um, for a lot of us. Um, so again, you know, this is a photo um, of our customer base, about 4,000 uh, consumers. These are people that we have a direct relationship with and a direct business transaction with. And this photo really just visualizes um, what it is that we've been able to do on our farm and what's allowed us to position ourselves a little higher in that value chain. Um, but if we fast, you know, if we if we backtrack a couple years. Um, this is this is when Dad first purchased the original farm out in Roanoke, Indiana. Um, it came with 20 acres and existing um, business on it, a confinement uh, feral to finish hog operation. He also had access to rent about a, a little over a thousand acres of row crops. So we had two just just two enterprises at that time um, with the thousand acres, and uh, we were barely able to support. Um, one full-time income, just my dad's full-time income. He was also working part-time off the farm. Um, and that's worth a thousand acres. Fast forward to today, um, our land base has decreased a little bit down to 550 acres. We're now supporting um, meaningful work for more than 10 uh, full-time incomes. Um, and the difference here, again, is where we position ourselves in the value chain and um, the inspiration behind that is kind of how we go about our marketing. Um, so, you know, going forward a little bit, uh, my parents had a little bit of a health crisis in the early 90s, which was kind of a paradigm shift for them and got them looking about um, how they were, you know, what were the practices they were employing on their farm for sustainable agriculture. And they kind of had a, a gut check and a heart change um, back in the late 90s. So dad finally got out of the hog business, sold the hogs right before the market gave out, I think, in 95. Um, and the first enterprise we then uh, did was uh, the grass-fed beef. Um, and at that time, this was still early on enough, we didn't even know that there was a consumer for this product. In fact, I think our first 
grass finished animals dad took to the sale barn and got commodity prices for them. Um, but today, again, we're finishing about 200 head on our farm and we're marketing about 400 head directly to the consumer. So we do work with a small group of producers for the extra animals. Um, we're pretty selective with who we work with. Ultimately, it has to be someone that we trust. Um, but then once we start to develop a customer base for the uh, cattle, we realized that those same customers would buy other products too. So we, we, could, we finally came full circle, got hogs back on the farm. This time out on pasture, we're finishing about 200 head um, present day. And uh, the third enterprise uh, we got going on is the, the lane hens, the pasture raised lane hens. We have about 6,000 lane hens on our farm. And these are all, all three of these species are stacked among the same anchor, acreage. Uh, so we're using a method called stack model enterprises, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and this is a, this is a chart here, this next slide that a couple of my brothers put together. This, this just shows what our gross margin is, what we're currently getting per enterprise per acre. Um, so this is inputs, no overheads. Um, and this is also marketing directly to our consumer customer base on uh, our online. Um, and if we were to change one thing about the way we're figuring these numbers, and that's if we were taking these same products to the commodity market, we would be losing uh, $1,400, about $1,500 per acre. Um, so that's a net opportunity cost of about $7,000. And that opportunity cost for us you know, really just is determined based on where we decide to position ourselves in the value chain. Again, it comes down to how we're going about our marketing. Um, so this is this is what it looks like. This is the value chain. This is a little chart we have uh, that we created here. So here we are, the farmer. We start out at the bottom. The, that's just how it is. Um, and our customer, they're at the top. So there's a long way in between here. And for our farm, this distance is an opportunity cost of uh, $7,100. Uh, $7, um, so how do we make the climb? How do we start to bridge the gap? Um, the first step is create a, a marketing foundation. Um, and this is comprised of three different legs. Um, we think about this as an example of a stool with three legs. You know, all three legs have to be the same length. You can't just have two or else the entire stool will topple over. Um, and building your marketing foundation, this is actually almost a talk on its own. Um, but just by reading a couple of your guys' comments, I think a lot of us, you know, have gotten this far and have figured this out. So I'm just going to give a little brief summary um, of this. You know, the first leg is we're thinking about our product. This is what we have to off offer to our customers. And when we're thinking about what it is we want to raise, what product do we want to, you know, do we want to raise on our farm, we need to make sure that it, it does a couple things, is that it matches our environmental resources. Here we're thinking about, you know, what are our land advantages. Uh, we also want to make sure it matches our financial resources. You know, some uh, livestock enterprises have a larger barrier to entry than others, thinking about grass-fed beef versus maybe, you know, raising pastured lane hens or poultry, a lot lower of a financial barrier to entry. Uh, the third resource we want to think about that we get right when determining what product we're going to raise is what's our social resource. So mainly thinking about what is our management capacity on our farm. Um, we have found that usually the first resource we run out of um, at our farm is our management capacity, and that's coming from a farm uh, that has seven boys who are involved. Um, so you want to make sure that you have enough management capacity to take on um, the products you're looking to, to raise. Last thing we want to do is make sure that that product is a product that our customer wants. And here we want to make sure that we are carving out a marketing niche for ourselves, but we're not over niching. Um, I, we've talked to a gentleman one time, I think he was um, out of Michigan somewhere. Um, I forget the name of the farm, but he said uh, what he wanted to do was he wanted to waste 100% Wagyu genetics wanted it to be uh, certified grass-fed, and it was going to be 100%. Uh, I'm sorry, certified organic, and he wanted it to be 100% grass-fed. Now there are customers who want, you know, one of each of those probably, but I've never met somebody who wants all three of those in the same place. So we want to make sure we don't carve ourselves into too far of a niche that we have a price point that doesn't work for anybody. So okay, so that's leg number one. We're going over to the right side of this uh, foundation uh, to the markability. We want to make sure that that product that we have 
you know, is marketable. So we're thinking more practical at this point, you know, what's, what's our presentation like, what's our branding like, you know, what kind of package are we employing and does it match our target market? You know, the main thing we found that we want to get right here is partnering with the right processor. Um, I think that's been a battle for a lot of us, especially our farm. We have hired and fired a couple processors over the year. And the number one takeaway we have from dealing with processors has been don't be afraid to travel to find the right processor. We're now traveling about 250 miles to a facility in Grand Rapids, Michigan called Byron Center Meats. Um, and it's an excellent facility. They have an excellent service, ex excellent staff they put together up there. I'm not going to dive too much into it, but make sure you, pro you pr partner with the, the right processor. They're really going to make this leg a lot easier. Um, and then the third leg we're talking about here is going to be um, our story. So communicating our story. And I would like to dive into this one a little deeper just because I think it's something that gets overshadowed a lot of times um, for us um, because we're so busy doing other things on the farm. For us, we feel like the single most important objective to telling our farm story is to build trust. You know, we're now seeing a consumer that is questioning the food items they're putting in their cart and more importantly, the companies that are behind those food items. Um, so I think the biggest thing that can help us differentiate is to build trust with our consumers. You see, we're no longer competing for quality, price, self, shelf space, or certifications. We're competing for the hearts and minds of people. I think it's true that um, people want to buy um, from people who believe what they believe. I think a lot of us are like this. Um, it all boils down to trust, and I think our, our, our ag society knows this. This is a billboard we pass on our way to Chicago to one of our buying clubs out that way. Um, and this is a really smart company. They've realized that if they lose trust in the consumer, they don't have a sustainable future. Um, the only thing they've forgotten is that trust, it can't be bought with a billboard. It can't be commercialized. Um, it, can't be, it can't be commoditized. Trust can only be earned um, through the investment of a connection um, in a relationship, um, and that takes time. Um, so I think their, their biggest mistake is that they've forgotten that it can't be bought uh, with a billboard. And, you know, this whole thing of establishing trust, I think this, this leaves a lot of opportunities for the, the small regional family farm. You see, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, people want to buy from people that they know, like, and trust. And then this is a quote from Simon Sinek, um, who's a marketing consultant for, you know, virtually all industries, but, you know, food is very personable. So I think we have, have a leg up on this. Um, you see, why you do what you do is the only thing that will differentiate what it is that you sell. Um, it's the only thing that's going to differentiate between some of the greenwashing we're seeing out there. It's the only thing that's going to differentiate from labels, um, labels similar to this. Your story is your biggest unfair advantage. Usually I tell a story that we heard from Joel Solitson on this, but I, I don't have time to dive into it today. But I think the saying is true that people don't really care what you know until they know that you care. Um, so, we, you know, starting with our story, I think, I think that goes a long way. Um, if we get that right, a lot of this becomes easier. But there's still a large gap here. So how do we, how do we make the rest of the climb? There's still a huge barrier here, and we've defined that barrier um, as inconvenience. Um, we believe that, that as a small, uh, for a small regional family farm, we can bridge this gap by making our, our product and our farm uh, more convenient. You see, not only do we have the products that our customers want, we're the ones they want to buy it from. Um, but, but this is what we need to get right. So again, we're thinking about a three-legged stool. Um, um, same thing, all three legs have to be the same length. The first stool or the first leg here stands for visibility. How do we make our farms more visible? You know, right now, I think a lot of us, um, I hear from a lot of people who say, you know, I can't find customers. Customers can't find, find me. I live too far from the city. Um, you know, I'm going to the farmer's market, but it feels a little saturated. Um, there might be one or two vendors there that's doing the exact same thing I'm doing, but I can tell you that the market is not saturated. It's just where we're going might give us a little perspective perceived saturation. Um, you see, we're going to the wrong place. Um, I think Alan Nation had a study, again, a couple years ago that said 80% of consumers turn online first when they're searching for grass-fed beef. Now, that might be slightly slightly different today now that we're seeing it become more available. But still, that's, that's a high percentage. Um, and this just is kind of some 
analytics to show how much time we are actually spending online these days. I think it sometimes as farmers, this is something that, that, that we recognize a little late. Um, and this is another study done by Food Market Insights that just she goes to show um, where the online uh, grocery industry looks like. It looks like it, we did about 20, uh, 20 and a half billion in 2016, and our projections are looking really attractive. Um, so the trend for online groceries, I mean, think about what Amazon is doing with Whole Foods. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of upside here. And the cool thing about the virtual nature of the Internet, that takes the royalness of our farms out of the equation. It doesn't matter if we're not near, um, you know, major populations. We can still create a lot of visibility um, through having a web presence. Um, we've had uh, a website now for, I think, since 2005. And um, over the years, it's kind of been like a snowball effect. We've been able to gain a lot of exposure. Now we're averaging about uh, 210,000 visitors a year to that website is what we did in 2017. Um, so you know, the cool thing about that is most of that visibility is regional. Um, so a lot of those visitors are coming just from the Midwest area around our farm, um, which is really helpful. Um, for us, since we're not going nationwide, but I, we think about the engagement that we're getting through our website. On average, I think um, our visitors are spending about four minutes per session. Some people are spending 40 minutes. Some people are spending 40 seconds. That's just how it is. But on average, they spend four minutes. And we like to think, you know, how long would we have to pay someone to stand at a farmer's market to keep our product in front of a potential customer for that same amount of engagement? Uh, well, we actually did the math because we thought it would be fun. It would take us seven full-time employees, and eventually that equates to $280,000 um, per year. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have that type of marketing budget. The cool thing is to start building visibility online. In today's world, the, the financial barrier to entry is $0 a month. Um, so there's no excuse. Even if we don't have a product to sell right now, get a website. It's free. You can start building exposure build awareness and anticipation early, and then that way when you do have a product that's ready to sell, you have a customer for that product right out the door. Then when you are ready to start taking online um, sales, you, you would need to transition to an e-commerce platform, which does get a little more expensive depending on your needs. We did develop our own custom platform. It's called grazecart.com. I'm not going to dive too much into that because, again, I don't have time. Um, but, okay. So this is kind of a symbol for um, the efforts that we're kind of doing as a whole online. And this is what this is what I call the path to purchase. This is usually the chronological order um, what our uh, customers will go through before they finally make a purchase. So every step down this, we call it a marketing funnel. Every step down this funnel people take, they are more likely to buy from us. So they start out here at the top as just you know, web traffic on the internet, surfing the web. Um, so the first thing we want to do is get traffic to our website. So a lot of people want to turn to Google first, which is great because I think 90% of traffic all originates back from Google. But a lot of people want to know how do I become, you know, number one for the search term grass-fed beef. Well, that's like getting your farm featured in Time Magazine or something. There's a lot of a lot of big companies competing for for this uh, keyword. Um, and if you're not shipping nationwide, it's not even that beneficial to come up and rank high for this keyword anyhow. Um, it really wouldn't be worth the time investment and the learning curve that would be involved. But there are other ways we can start um, building and getting traffic to our site. One of those is link building. A lot of us know about this. You know, The idea is getting as many leaks out on others' websites that point back to ours as possible. Um, we can do that with some online directories. Uh, there's a lot of other ways to do this. My brother Blaine... Um, for an entire year, made it his goal to get a link out on a new website um, every week. Um, so that's 52 week links in one year. And the cool thing is you go up to that initial um, investment, and those links are always there. They're always pushing traffic back to your site. And when, when Google, Google looks at those links as references. Um, so the more links you have out there pushing back to your site, the more credibility you can build with Google. And Again, with Google, if we can't rank number one for grass-fed beef, you at least want to rank number one for your farm name. Most people aren't going to remember the name of your website if you give it to them at the farmer's market or just in conversation. So they'll go to Google first. And if you don't rank number one for your farm, uh, that's, a, that's a bad deal. So in order to make sure um, this is something that can happen for you, you want to be sure that you claim your Google business listing. 
Um, this basically just determines how your company appears to Google, and it's again, it's completely free to do, and it can also boost our, lo our local rankings, sorry, local rankings for terms like grass-fed beef followed by maybe a regional search like our city, because now Google knows where you're located. Um, and over time, once it associates your company with the term grass-fed, um, you'll come up higher in local rankings and searches like this. Um, if you search Fort Wayne grass-fed beef, um, I think Seven Sons, we consistently will come up first. And that's, again, that's after doing this for a long time. But okay, now we have traffic entering our funnel and it's hitting our website. Um, now, some people will purchase right away. Most people don't. We're getting 210,000 visitors a year and definitely not all those people are buying from us. Um, so a lot of them will leave. It's just how it is. We usually don't make the, the purchase off of our first visit. Um, but we want to make sure that we make the most of that traffic coming into our site. We want a way to follow up with them. And we can do some cool things with some retargeted Facebook ads and Google ads, but I'm, I'm going to try and keep it simple today. So the first, the easiest thing we can do to follow up with someone is to capture their email address and make them become a, what we call a newsletter subscriber. So that's a goal we're trying to do on our website. But first thing, we want to make sure, um, I forgot what my next slide was, but the first thing we want to be doing is making sure that we understand that everyone online has a very short attention span. Um, it's just how we are online. I think we encounter about 3,000 commercial ads a day. So the sooner we understand that, the better, because I think about 40% of your visitors will actually leave your site if they don't see your site loading in, in the first five seconds. Um, which is a large, that's a large, um, a substantial portion of your traffic. Um, so if they're going right back right away, Google actually will call that a bounce. And if your bounce rate's too high, they, they could penalize your website. They also might penalize your website if it's not mobile friendly. So make sure you have a website that's mobile friendly. Once they get to your site, you want to communicate as clearly as possible, as fast as possible with this least amount of words is what is possible. So you want to communicate what it is you do, what's in it for your customer using the least amount of words as possible. We do that with the top portion of our website um, using this header message here, you know, um, using the least amount of words possible again from our pastures to your neighborhood. And we can use our photo to try and help describe what it is that we offer. Um, so we want to grab their attention right away. Um, usually we hold ourselves to a five second rule. We want people to know what it is we offer and what's in it for them in the first five seconds. This is one of our Gracecart clients. This is a Gracecart website. This farm is from um, Missouri, I believe it is. Um, but they did a really good job with their header message here. They, they told us what it is they offer, nutrient-rich foods, um, and peace of mind so your family can thrive. That is, that's what's in it for their customer. And they did that in just a few words. Um, I always like to slow that side because I think they did a really good job. But here's another, another farm that's doing a really good job at communicating trust right away as soon as someone lands on their website. Um, and the next thing we want to do, the most likely thing someone's going to do when they hit our website is scroll. So then the third thing we want to tell them is how do they buy from us? And we try to hold ourselves to three simple steps, which is actually pretty difficult to do when you think about it. It took us a long time before we had a business model that we could even explain and was easy for a customer to understand in three steps. So this is almost more of a business model than a, than a marketing model. Um, Another quick tip, it's always nice to be able to display testimonies on your website. Usually people don't like to be the first person to buy something, so this just builds credibility. Uh, we call it social proof. So now we got them going to our website. We're communicating very clearly, but again, we want a way to follow up with them because most of them are not going to purchase um, you know, from the first visit. Some do. That's great. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture their email. Now, a lot of us probably have a sign up form on our website to subscribe to our newsletter, you know, for tips and tricks on marketing. You're probably getting some emails that way, um, but most likely you're not getting a ton. We weren't when we had it like um, just a basic sign up form. So we replaced it with something of value. We're trying to exchange something that they might be interested in in exchange for an email address and we're seeing our signups go way up by doing this so we're thinking about what is on the top of mind for our web visitors you know most of them are here to get a closer connection to their farmer and to their food so what we did you know farm tours have always been a great actual acquisition tool for us um, so what we did is we made it virtual because farm tours are hard to scale you know we have to be around for it it's hard to convince people to drive from some of your further markets, like for us, you know, it's hard to convince someone to drive three hours from Chicago to come out for a farm tour. Um, so we made it virtual. 
Um, so as soon as someone signs up to our newsletter or our, our, um, our, we get their email, the first thing they receive, their first five emails, is an in-depth, behind-the-scenes look into our farm. We go into talking about um, you know, what's the number one factor that determines the health of their food. We talk about how it starts in the soil and how we're employing that factor on our farm. You know, we give them a behind the scenes look of each enterprise. It's very, it's a very personal experience and it builds a lot of trust. Um, and at the end of this farm tour, this five day farm tour, so they get one email every day, we do give them finally an offer to purchase. The first five days, it's just content. We're just trying to educate them and present them something that they might find value in. And then on the last day, we give them um, an offer to purchase a, um, a, a sampler bundle that we created. It's like 15 pounds. It's at a little bit of a discount for them, which we can get targeted with our discount um, because obviously we're trying to get someone to convert to a first-time buyer. Again, the barrier to entry to start collecting email addresses is zero dollars. Uh, MailChimp is a very powerful tool. Um, and you can use that to create automated um, email sequences like this one that we built. Um, we use a, a marketing software called Drip, um, but you can do it in, in MailChimp and it's free up to the first 2,000 subscribers. So once you have their email address, you can continue to follow up with them. Even if they don't convert after that original onboarding campaign, now you have their email address. You can continue to educate them, continue to build trust. Um, and again, a, an email subscriber is a lot more likely to convert than just a web visitor or even a Facebook fan. We put a lot more priority on email than we do any other social media platform. And you can see our, our, our newsletter, we send it out every Sunday and it almost creates like this heartbeat look when we look at the traffic that's coming to our website. You can see every weekend there, it kind of spikes. So now we're getting more traffic back to our site and building more exposure with Google or credibility with Google. Um, so there we have it. They're down further in the funnel. We're more likely to get them to convert. Now what's even better than getting an email subscriber is getting them to create a customer account on our website. Now, when they create an account, they still don't have to buy, um, but we can get a little more targeted with our email follow-ups once we have their account. So to try, and, to try and incentivize them to do this, we want to be really clear about our call to action on our website. Usually, it's good practice to try and keep yourself to as few call to actions as possible. We try to maintain ourselves just to two, you know, the call to action, sign up for the farm tour, or to create an account. And you're going to see this throughout our entire website. Even when they add items to their cart, it just takes them to the create um, account page, our, our, yeah, our account page right here. Um, and when they do create account, they give us their zip code. It's the first thing they give us. And that means we can get basically assign them to their closest pickup location in their area. Or if they qualify for home delivery, we know that you know, they would be a home delivery customer. And once we know that, we can get very targeted with our responses. So basically, we deliver to a bunch of pickup locations throughout the Midwest. It's you know the Joe Salt and Buying Club model, um, and every location, every delivery we make has a deadline for when our customers need to have their order in by. So we have automated a deadline reminder email just to remind people a courtesy reminder to get their order in, or else they're going to have to wait and they'll miss out till the next delivery, which we're delivering every six weeks. So if they if they miss out, they have to wait 12 weeks to get their order. So it's a really targeted email, and we're it's our by far our best performing email. We're seeing a 14% conversion rate on this email, which equivalates to about I think it's over $150,000 in revenue um, on an annual basis from just this one email that we can automate. Um, so again, so they're coming to our website. You know, we're being very clear about the content we want them to know right away. We're trying to convert them to a subscriber, or even better yet, a user. And then once we have their email address and once they do finally purchase, we can continue to just throw them back in the funnel and keep feeding the funnel. And once we have something like this in place, um, you know, it does take a little bit of a, an initial time investment, but the life expectancy of our marketing funnel far exceeds that time investment we put in place. Um, this is, you know, that email onboarding campaign we, we built that took some initial time investment, but it's always communicating with our customers, always building trust with our customers 24 seven. There's probably someone taking that farm tour right now. Um, there's probably people creating accounts right now as I'm talking to you. Um, so this, once you get it in place, this is always working for you. You can add different things to it. You know, you can start sending Facebook traffic here um, or you know, Insta tra Instagram traffic here. So once you get your marketing funnel in place, any money that you spend on Facebook ads or Google ads, 
now you can actually, you know, you have a system in place to really leverage that traffic. Okay, so I kind of rambled about the visibility leg, but here we are, that's visibility. Leg number two um, that I want to dive into is accessibility. So we can go a long way at making our farms con more convenient by being more accessible. When we think about uh, convenience, uh, we like to think about a vending machine. You know, vending machines are always in a very visible uh, and accessible place. Um, this is actually a raw milk vending machine that somebody sent us. I thought that was funny. Um, so the first step we took on our farm to make us more uh, accessible was an, an on-farm store, a farm stand. Um, we're, and this is more beneficial for us than probably some others because, you know, we're just 15 minutes from Fort Wayne, which is about a population of 250,000 people. Excuse me. So this is our on-farm vending machine. Um, it's self-serve, so we don't have to pay someone to be out here. Um, with that, we can leave it open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. Um, we're not, you know, we're the, it, we have upgraded it actually uh, over the years. And actually, this is now um, outdated because we've upgraded it to now a building that's about twice this size as well. Um, but it's really worked out for us because we have minimal, um, you know, road traffic, public exposure. So we don't really have to worry about things like theft. We do keep a camera out there. Um, and even if the numbers don't match up exactly at the end of the month, it, it sure as heck beats paying someone to be out there eight hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so the next step we took to making our farm more accessible um, was to start buying clubs. So we have about 50 pickup locations around the Midwest now. Um, and originally, these started from people who found our website, found us, we were visible online, so they found our website from like cities like Indianapolis and Chicago, which are two and a half, three hours away. They were driving all the way to our farm stand, our farm store, loading up their coolers and hauling all of that traffic back uh, to their home. So they came to us with this idea, hey, please bring it, bring it to us. We'll send you guys orders in advance. You can use our driveways. You know, some people had small business parking lots we could use. So now uh, this is what it's all been built off of. The truck leaves full, usually on a Saturday, because that works best for most people's um, uh, work schedule. The truck leaves full and it comes home empty. And we would have loved to have seen something like this back when we were going to farmer's market. Um, I'm sure a lot of you can identify with coming home with a, a fairly full truck from a long day at the market. Uh, this is what one of our location looks like in Columbus, Ohio. We've, uh, looks like we've been delivering here since 2011. We deliver on a six week cycle. Now it's important to think about if you, if maybe you are doing buying clubs or maybe you're looking at doing more, if you're, maybe you're looking at establishing your own, um, you know, it doesn't have to be every six, six weeks. Originally we were delivering just, I think once a quarter during the, uh, the growing season. And then we took a break in the winter. I'm not, I'm not sure why we used to take a break in the winter, but then we took a break for six months. Um, but that allowed us delivering just once every three months allowed us to pile up enough orders to be sure that we could fill that truck. Um, and slowly it's just, you know, it's just as we've gotten more volume, we see that that window, uh, that delivery frequency kind of increase a little bit. So now we're down to every six weeks. One day we might get down to once a month. We'll see. But it usually takes about six weeks for us to, to fill a truck. Um, this is a little bit of what our buying club e economics look like. Um, so let's see here. Next screen. So again, when we're thinking about starting um, new pickup locations, there is a new tool that we've employed on our website about two years ago. Um, this was back when we didn't have quite as many of these locations established here, but we basically just created an application, a basic application form that anyone on our website could fill out if they wanted to host a pickup location in their small business or, or their, even if their driveway, if they had enough street parking. Um, and over the last two years, we've had over 200 people fill out that application. So there's 200 customers of ours who are looking for a more accessible way to get our product. And I think this just kind of shows that there is a market out there for this stuff and a lot of potential, and a lot of room for, for a lot of small regional family farms. Um, so that's been a really helpful tool for us. But you know, if you don't have a lot of exposure going to your website right away, you're probably not going to get a lot of um, people filling out your form. So we did originally approach some small businesses that it kind of made sense to have that mutually beneficial relationship. We're thinking more like CrossFits, um, you know, chiropractic offices, you know, some wellness centers um, are happy to partner with you. 
Um, and I've, I've talked to a lot of farms who've gone that route and had a lot of success, especially with some CrossFit gyms. We're mostly residential, um, but I know a lot of people have worked with a lot of small businesses and it's worked out really well. Our delivery infrastructure, um, we're now using these um, Sprinter vans uh, by Mercedes, but originally, you know, we it just got to a point where we wanted something more reliable because we we're making enough deliveries. But when we started out, I think our first delivery uh, was made in the nine passenger family van pulling a reefer trailer. So it's important not to, you know, it does not have to be perfect. You know, you can start, start small um, and go from there. I think a lot of us have a pickup truck. And I know some people who have just thrown a chest freezer in the back of the truck, especially if they're not traveling too far. Um, and my brother Blaine has an actual, an entire vlog video on our on our grace cart website about low cost delivery methods and i can post a link to that in the chat um, after our discussion here but taking another sledgehammer at the convenience barrier we're now offering home delivery um a lot of it through um or i guess a smaller portion of it through fedex and ups um which it's been really nice for the customer obviously because it's very convenient but um, the shipping costs and the packaging costs are kind of a barrier so we're not seeing a ton of success, success with it. And eggs have really kind of been our initial gateway drug for a lot of people to get them hooked on our product. And uh, through shipping with FedEx and UPS, there's just no way with the fragility of eggs that we can get them to work. So something we've done, we actually learned from another farm, um, is to partner with local courier companies. Almost every major city across the, the U.S. will have a local courier company or two and some of them are fairly open with working with local small um, farms. We've partnered with two of them so far, one courier in Indiana that services almost every zip code for us in the state, um, which is a pretty large radius. And then we have another courier in Chicago who services most of Chicago for us. And they knock the socks off of UPS and FedEx as far as a delivery fee standpoint goes any day of the week. Um, I think we're just at a $9 flat fee for any size orders for our customers. And that's not building um, that cost into the product. And we're also able to cut down on some of our packaging costs because what we do is we just will store a walk-in cooler in their facility. Now, some of them might not be open to an idea like this, but we just basically will lease a little bit of space. And then our orders will go to them the night before. And they're only out of cold storage for typically just four to five hours when they're out in the driver's vehicle out for the delivery for the day. So we don't need nearly as much, you know, insulation or, or we don't even, we're not even using dry ice. We're just using gel packs. So that's really cut down on our packaging costs. This is a picture inside the cooler. We can actually get a close to, I think, 50, 50 orders or so in there. Okay, but back to the stool. So that's accessibility. Um, the last leg we want to talk about is availability. So for a lot of us, it's been a struggle to keep our products available all season around. Obviously, there's, you know, ideally we finish our um, livestock, you know, at the end of the growing season. Um, and we take, you know, um, usually we have an order form all year. And once all the animals are spoken for, we're, you know, we're out of stock. But um, again, it might not seem fair to us, but the consumer, I think, is at a point where they want to buy, you know, um, a wide selection and at any time. Um, so for us, it's very difficult to finish grass-fed beef out of season um, using high quality forages. Um, so we've made some investment into some cold storage. Um, these are um, um, fiberglass uh, uh, freezer units made by a company called Polar King in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, but they uh, will distribute through, actually I think they distribute worldwide. Um, and we have figured it has saved a lot of cost, even if we didn't have our own freezer infrastructure and we're just using a cold storage facility nearby in our local city. Um, we save a lot storing four animals in a freezer um, versus trying to finish those animals, those same four animals on high quality forages, um, you know, outside of the growing season. So I'm not talking about trying to maintain animals, you know, outside of the growing season, trying to finish animals on high quality forage. We're looking at right around $300 a month versus $30 a month to store those animals um, in a freezer. Now, obviously, if we're storing most of our product in the freezer, we want, you know, a high quality packaging, and that goes back kind of to a marketable product, but we need something that has some longevity to it. So we're using roll stock um, cryovac packaging. Um, you also want to have a really good first in, first out inventory system. So a great sort order inside the freezer. I've talked to quite a few people. 
who've um, lost quite a bit of product over the years. In fact, I think um, for us, we've um, just misplaced. I forget what it was. I shouldn't probably be talking about that, but we play, misplaced a little bit of cottage bacon last week. But um, it's very hard. I've talked to a lot of farms. This is a, a huge battle when we're storing a lot of product in the freezer is to have a good inventory system, both you know, a good pick system in the freezer physically, but also a good virtual system, you know, that's maintaining our, our live inventory on our website, making sure that we're not selling out of anything. Our software we developed for our farm, um, and now that some other farms are using as well, it handles all of that for us online, which has been super helpful. Um, and since we are selling most of our products online, uh, we're trying to incentivize our customers to buy in bulk. So it's, you know, it's pretty difficult to to capture a sale online um, for a lot of us and we don't make a lot of them so we want to try and make it a big sale um, so you know most of us have been selling freezer beef for a long time that's what we were doing um, and we had found that most of the cutting instructions that our customers were filling out most of them you know had never done it before and they were just using our suggested instructions anyhow um, so what we did is we we just decided, decided instead of having people, you know, pre-order and give us their custom instructions and then have to wait two weeks or three weeks for us to get the product back from the processor, we have our processor pre-assemble all of our bulk freezer bundles, and we have actually done it for the other species as well. They pre-assemble them for us ahead of time into 45 pounds standard one-eighth of a beef bundle. Um, and I know a lot of people who have said, well, if I went to a pre-assembled bundle, I'd have a lot of customers who don't want to give up the freedom of choice. And it was a little bit of a battle for us at the time, but we rarely have, honestly, anyone request that these days. They're pretty happy with what's included in that bundle. It's a lot more marketable again. Um, we can have a set price on that bundle where they're not paying by the hanging weight because we guarantee 45 pounds because we use the ground beef as the filler. Um, so this has been really, really helpful for us to try and get a, um, an, a lot higher of an average order size. I think we average about $200, $250, $230 per, per order, per purchase that we get, um, which is, which is you know, really helpful to try and fill our vans. So we want to have a wider selection. So we also, taking this idea of buying in bulk a little further as well, we sell Almost all of our individual cuts, you know, we sell in individual packages like one pound of ground beef, you know, an eight ounce filet mignon, but we also sell cases of almost everything. So the same case that our processor, you know, will pack in and that comes back straight into our freezer, we will sell that case as an item on our website for a discount. That way when someone's going to pull an order on our freezer, instead of pulling a bunch of individual small items for a lower value, they're just pulling cases out and it's been a lot more efficient and that's also helped us get that um, order or average order size um, quite a bit higher. Um, so um, a wider selection, that's what that's what a lot of our customers want. This, you know, obviously it's more convenient. It's going to be a larger transaction again. It's a fuller truck. If you're not going to offer it, they're not going to buy it. So get creative. We actually... Um, a good testimony to this. We've always sold a 20 pound ground beef bundle, which is our case. Um, and then we started offering a 40 pound bundle thinking most, most people probably aren't willing to, to bulk up that much on ground beef. That was really successful. And we recently just started offering an 80 pound ground beef bundle that a lot of people are going in together with friends on. That's been very helpful for us as well, because it's been hard for us to move all of our ground. Um, we seem to pile up on some of our ground. Um, but again, if you don't offer it, you're not going to know if it sells, so just try it. Um, and having a wide selection does not mean that we have to raise the product ourselves. And we like to stress this a lot. We try to stay really focused on our production enterprises and keep those running as profitable as they can. Um, so, you know, we don't, if we don't have the management power to bring on another production enterprise, we're, you know, focus is key. So we don't dabble into it, for instance. Pasture poultry, that's not an enterprise that we have on our farm, but some of you might be familiar with Greg Gunthorp out of LaGrange, Indiana, who has an, a really high quality pasture poultry product. So we're getting it in from him on a wholesale basis and just reselling it um, from that point. Um, and we, we sell, I think, about 20,000 birds of Greg's every year. Um, and it's been a really key relationship, a really good relationship for us because Greg has really established a... Um, a wholesale market. He's going to a lot of restaurants and food service 
So we get it in on a wholesale basis. He doesn't have a huge direct consumer outlet. Um, so if we can partner and make some key relationships to widen our selection, um, again, it's about becoming that one-stop shop for the customer. We want them spending you know, as much of their grocery dollar with us as possible. So we've also partnered with some local you know, grass-fed dairy guys for raw cheese. Um, we even have um, wild-caught seafood coming in from uh, Tony Woods, who's a fisherman out there in Alaska. Um, and we sell a lot of wild caught salmon on our website every year, more so than we ever dreamed we would. Um, we're actually moving, I think, um, a couple pallets um, a year of, of wild caught salmon. And my brother actually was out in Boston this week. I think he's still out there um, at the North American uh, Seafood Expo, trying to get a wider selection of seafood on our website. So again, wider selection does not mean we have to offer it. So. So that's, that sums it up. I think I, I covered it uh, even early um, this time. I didn't eat every time I practiced it, but that's our convenience barrier. Our three legs, again, are visibility, accessibility, and availability. If we get those three, three things right, we can really do a lot to you know make the rest of that climb up to our consumer. Um, so this platform um, is something that uh, if you build this convenience platform and a lot of visibility for um, for your farm, eventually you will be seen. We are we have now started to attract some of the attention that we originally um, early on thought we'd finally get, um, and our eggs are now being carried um, in several major supermarket chains here um, around our region. Um, so, you know, once we build that visibility for our farms, all of our other sales channels will kind of follow this. So our focus is directly to the consumer in our online marketing first. We do have a wholesale business, which we're selling, you know, obviously we're going distribution, selling to some mom and pop um, shops and some, some local restaurants. And actually that's about, I think, 40% of our annual revenue. But we don't put a lot of focus on it because that just kind of follows um, what we're doing to build visibility through our direct marketing. Um, I think most of our key, really key wholesale accounts that have brought us uh, the majority of that 40% found out about us from a Google search online. Um, actually, we just picked up an account um, called Lincoln Financial in Fort Wayne where they employ, I think, 2,000 people and they're feeding about 1,500 people every day through their cafeteria um, and now they're serv serving some of our products in their food court and they found us just off of a, of a Google search off of that visibility um, that credibility we finally were able to build um, with Google so if you build build your convenience platform your, I think your farm will finally be seen um, and this is really exciting because I think there's a lot of other guys out there who are who are doing this even some better than we are um, and we've we had the privilege now of working with quite a few of those um, some of those farms through the graze cart platform that we have developed. Um, this is a farm from from Flo Florida who's doing an excellent job um, with the buying club model in his state. And um, I, again, I think we have about 125 clients who are having a lot of success um, um, you know, with this same model, this convenience model um, throughout the country. Um, but that pretty much sums up the talk. Again, I'm here a little early, but if you have questions, um, I'd love to go over those and let's see. Oh, this is Gabe Brown. He's also using the software. They're doing it. Paul, Paul and Gabe are doing an excellent job out there in Bismarck, South Dakota. So let's see. I haven't been keeping a good eye on this during the talk, but if I'm going to start from the top and try and address each question one by one. I don't want to miss anybody. Yeah, Brooks, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate right, it. Right. Thanks, Steve. There's a couple questions in there that, uh, you know, Greg, for instance, back when you were talking about um, uh, collecting and maintaining email accounts, uh, email addresses, mm -hmm. he was asking about, um, uh, you know, emailing to Gmail accounts that uh, kick everything to a promotions tab. Do you know anything about that and how to avoid that? Um, you know what, Greg? I'm not familiar with that. Um, hmm. um, again, Blaine and I kind of tag team some of the marketing we're doing. He's really focused on what we're doing with the direct marketing. Um, what uh, 
if if you don't mind a follow up question, Greg, just and we'll probably swing back to this. Just let me know what um, uh, email service you're using. Are you using Mailchimp or something else? Oh, okay. So it's is it a filtering? It looks like a. Um, you know, I haven't heard a lot of feedback who from customers of ours who are getting um, our emails sent to the promotions tab. But I, I tell you what a lot of people have done is they've stopped including so many photos in their email. Sometimes if we have a lot of photos um, in the email blast that we're sending out, it can get either triggered as spam or sent to an, an, a folder that we would rather not it end up in. Um, so what we've been taking a more of approach now lately is to include uh, less, less photos in our e emails and a lot more personable text. We actually write all of our emails as if we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So not a corporate feel at all. Actually, um, I think all of our emails are sent from, are typed up and sent from Blaine personally. And it's it's all sent from his name talking to one person. Um, and I know some people have said that has helped with um, some of their spam and their email deliverability, but email's finicky. It's not 100%. Um, and uh, there's still a lot to figure out there. Um, Brooks, along that line, Brooks, yeah. I'm wondering, um, do you so you said you said they're they're personalized from Blaine? Um, do you do you mean personalized as in they have their address to that individual's name? Because that that was my understanding that makes the difference between going to a promotional tab versus your regular inbox. Is that if it's personalized to that person's name? Do you guys do that? Do you know? We do do that, and that might be a factor that plays into it as well. Um, Again, Blaine wears a lot more of the email marketing hat. Um, he might have a better question for that, but always, and you guys can feel free to email me too some questions that I can look into for you. Um, Brooks at sevensons.net um, is the address. I'll just type that into the chat. But we do actually do that, Steve. Um, send it from um, a personal name, not from you know the corporate address. Um, so that might be a factor that plays into it as well. Um, and let's see here. Any other questions? Yeah, while Brooks is looking at the questions here, if you've got more questions, get them in the chat box. We've got a little, we've got some time here. So if, uh, if there's something on your mind, put it in the chat box. Brooks, I think that next question um, was again from Greg, that the next question that wasn't addressed, and he was wondering about, um, you know, working with other producers to sell their food on your website. Does that put you into additional regulations and, and issues that you have to deal with when you're selling salmon from your, your guy in Alaska and, um, you know, dairy that's, from someone else? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, our license um, that we have is a wholesale food establishment license, which actually allows for 80% of our sales to be done retail. And again, we're not, we, don't, we don't do any processing on our farm. We never are handling with any raw products. So we really are technically in the USDA's eye be, having that wholesale food establishment license. We're, we're just a, uh, equivalent to a, a food distributor or a food warehouse to them. Um, so we're not doing any processing ex minus the eggs. We do do some egg washing on our farm, which just gets us a month or a quarterly inspection from the state, I believe it is. Um, so no, we don't really have any extra regulations or hoops to work through as long as we're always selling a finished and packaged product. We're not doing any value add on our farm. Um, I'd see a question from Eric here. If you could sell um, only one product, what product would that be? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, again, uh, grass-fed beef was, that's our staple, it always has been, and that's our, our largest channel or um, um, uh, uh, collection or category. Um, but the eggs have been really scalable for us, um, especially going distribution. Um, it's been a lot e easier for us to hit a price point that could go distribution with the eggs. Um, and again, it's kind of been a, a gateway drug for a lot of our customers because it's something that, you know, everybody needs eggs and it's something they have to keep coming back for. Um, so I'd probably have to go with eggs on that one. But again, um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to throw all my eggs in one basket. Um, 
What kind of markups are you implementing from your wholesale to retail program? That's another good question. It's uh, we like to see a 30% margin. And um, I'll tell you right now that we do not <laughs> normally reach that, but that's usually our goal. Um, and a lot of the items we are bringing in is to almost seen as lost leaders. We're trying to widen that selection and fill more of the shopping cart. So we're usually not hurting, hitting a 30% margin. That's what we like to see in order to make um, it you know, profitable for us. Um, but like I say, a lot of them don't hit that, but that's what we like to see. And that's usually what a retailer is going to want to see as well. If any of you are thinking about going um, wholesale, um, typically they like to see at least 30% margin. Brooks, it looks like Jason has a follow-up question to that comment about uh, wondering if that's profitability percentages on each line. I think that's Jason. Um, Jason, is that what you're asking? Okay, are you? Um, that's the that's the the margin that we want to see on yeah any product that we bring on. So not necessarily as a collection as a whole. That's just kind of where we want to start is right at thirty percent. And that's that's not a markup. That's that's a margin from the cost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Katie's got a question then, and um, she's wondering about when you guys were starting with this direct marketing. How did you avoid customers that uh, who didn't want to inconvenience you? Was there any issue with that for you guys? Um, inconvenience us. Um, let's see. Um, are you, yeah, Katie, are you, just to define that question, are you asking more so as far as how were we able to bridge the gap since we weren't convenient at that time? Um, and how are we still able to convince some of those early loyal customers to, let's see, we deliver to town in the winter and folks won't order because they don't want me to have to come. Oh, um, huh. You know, we, I don't know, maybe you have more considerate customers than we do because usually most of them don't have a problem. Um, our biggest problem is getting, um, having to battle with snow during the winter time um, out here. Um, that can give be a little bit of a logistical challenge um, um, for us. And a lot of people don't want to be out on the road during, you know, days like that. So we're having to reschedule quite a few deliveries during the winter. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe your customers are a little bit more considerate than ours are. Any other tactics that you utilize to increase average order size? Um, that is another good question. And yes, um, something that we're now doing, um, it's, a, uh, it's a method called the product launch method. Um, and this is something that was kind of inspired by um, the master email marketer is what we call him. His name is Jeff Walker. Um, and it's basically um, just a sale, but it's a sale event that we'll run online on our website that we ask people to opt into. It's basically a sale that will run during typically a five-day ordering period. So it's almost like a flash sale. And we always time that sale um, when it works best for us. So for beef, we have a uh, usually a harvest sale, and that's usually in the winter time once we finish most of our animals and we stocked up our freezer. Um, and that's when we give our best prices of the year. And we've now are at the point where our customers anticipate that sale, and that's when they will bulk bulk up and buy you know a half a beef going with friends. Um, you know that's when we started offering that 80 pound ground beef bundle. Um, and yes, that has seen order sizes go um, way up. And we, we do these flash sales or these launches is what we call them for a lot of the different collections. So we'll do, we've done the beef harvest sale. You know, we've done a, a, a wild for seafood sale. So we ran a big flash sale on all of the wild caught salmon we get in from Alaska. Um, but it's important to always have a reason for why you're running um, a launch. Um, and for us, the reason, you know, for running that launch on the seafood was is that as soon as we got in the 2017 catch, because it's always caught during September, as soon as we got in our first order from that catch, we ran a big flash sale on it, letting people know you're getting the freshest salmon at the best price, um, um, you know, that you can at this time of year. And that encouraged a lot of people to balk up on it. So we sold like 25 pound boxes of salmon. And actually, when we ran that launch, 
um, we moved more salmon in that five day period than we did in the entire year of 2016 before we were doing um, these sale events. So those have been really successful for us to get that average order size um, higher. In regards to beef, do you try and make as many different cuts as possible? Um, yeah, that's another good question as far as trying to offer as many steak um, you know, cuts as we can. Um, you know, we don't have a, I want to say we have a huge steak selection, and that's mainly because we're only doing boneless steaks. Um, we're not doing any bone-in steaks because I think it is the USDA's regulation that you can't save any bone-in cuts after the animals reach a certain age. I forget what age it is. I think it's closer to 28 or 30 months. Um, so we just selected not to save any hard bone cuts. So we're limited to just the boneless cuts. Um, and we're not doing a whole lot of value add to any of our products because our processor doesn't have um, many capabilities to it. So outside of smoking you know, ham and bacon and, and doing some sausages, we don't have a whole lot of, haven't been able to find that relationship for someone who can do a lot of value add for us. Do you add a delivery charge or is that rolled onto your prices? Um, some of it is factored in, not all of it. Um, so we do run a delivery charge, um, but it, we try to keep it at a competitive charge. For picking up at our buying clubs, it's a $4.95 flat fee. Um, and if someone wants home delivery through the courier, it's just a $9 flat fee. And um, again, that's actually not building, we're actually building less into, into that cost. So that's pretty much just covers what we get charged through the courier. Um, and then we're doing $9 flat fee plus 99 cents per pound for our FedEx orders. So that adds up, adds up pretty quick. So thank you, Brooks, for all these fantastic yeah. answers. You seem to know just I, about, about the business. Jason, um, <laughs> like he's, he's uh, building off of that last question about um, doing your flash uh, you know, bulk sales. Does that negatively cannibalize your full price orders, or do you feel that uh, the finishing and processing fully justifies the margin sacrifice? Um. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of both. The sales have been so successful for us and have actually been a really good acquisition tool that we justify it by the um, the more cus or the, the customers we're acquiring because of the sales. It builds a lot of buzz. People, word of mouth travels about these really quick. Um, so we actually get a lot of first-time customers to try us out from these sales. Um, and we've just recently started doing it, so we'll know more as the remainder of this year comes on um, to see if, you know, if, if you know, we want to make sure that we're not cannibalizing it and people are just, you know, bulking up all at once and then they're, you know, not ordering again for three months. Or if we're going to see a residual effect of enough new customers coming on that are reordering, it makes it, you know, worth our while. So we'll know more um, as, as time goes on with that one. Okay, I'm just going back through here, make sure I didn't miss anything. If I miss someone's question, just let me know. Now's the time. Yeah, Brooks, I don't think we've missed any questions yet. So if anybody's got one, uh, we still have a few more minutes with them. So go ahead and get it in the chat box. Um, so, Brooks, when you had mentioned um, that you guys have that wholesale food establishment license, and that's kind of what le allows you to, um, you know, to sell other, um, you know, other producers' products, um, that, that mm -hmm. makes me think, um, have you guys thought about doing your own on-farm processing and taking that leap to do everything in-house, um, or has that discussion come up? Have you thought about that? 
Yes, the discussion has come up. Um, and that side of things, kind of more diving into the processing and production, is not the hat I wear on the farm. Um, so, but we have, you know, we haven't had that discussion. We've steered away uh, from it just because of, I mean, the overhead investment that would be and the economy of scale that we need to have right away to make it a profitable, uh, you know, added enterprise here on the farm and again it comes down to a lot of our management bandwidth as well we just don't quite have you know you definitely need the right people around who knows who knows that that side of the business um, to make something like that work especially for especially for the beef you know um, you know doing something for maybe hogs or or poultry if we're raising poultry you know that might be something that wouldn't be quite the financial barrier to get into um, but again, Greg Gunthorpe is doing that um, in his area here. Just He's an hour from us on the farm, so he'll actually sometimes process our laying hens for us, which has been a really good relationship to have. Um, so yeah, you know, of course, that's always a thought to try and you know bring the processing in-house, but we're, we're really, really are um, really satisfied and happy with the processor that we've ended up with now there in Byron, Byron Center, Michigan. Um, I think if you would have asked me that question before we had switched to those guys, we probably would have had would have been you know, a lot more serious about considering something like that. And it's been really nice also to avoid all the regulation battles. We've actually stayed um, pretty far under the radar. That wholesale food establishment license, all the more we get with that is a, um, a six month inspection from our USDA inspector who actually typically only shows up like once every eight or nine months. Um, but that's pretty much, and he's been really, really workable. Um, and then we get a state inspector in once a quarter for processing the eggs. Um, so we've really been able to stay under the regulation radar, um, just being, you know, a food warehouse per se. Yeah, that's, that's great. You guys obviously have a good thing going. So it's, um, good that you talked about it, but I, you, you know what you're doing. Um. Another question then, so you had mentioned uh, specifically about your email marketing being kind of um, one of the more, you know, one, the thing that you focus on the most. That's what drives the most right. uh -huh. sales. Could you mention a little bit about your social media, you know, presence, your social media strategy? Is it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Or what do you put a lot of attention on? Do you have a full-time staffer on that? What What's your efforts uh, real briefly in that? Yes, um, that's a great question. Um, again, like you were saying, Steve, we do put main priority on email marketing. Um, in our minds, it, one email address on our newsletter is um, 10 times the worth of getting one Facebook like. Because in order to reach your entire email list, your entire email following that you work hard to grow, you don't have to pay anything. You send an email blast, you reach everybody. On Facebook, you, your audience you don't really own. If you want to reach your entire audience, or even just a substantial part uh, portion of your audience, you have to, you know, go into paid advertising. So that's why we haven't focused as much on social media. But I mean, if there is a platform that we do focus more on, is um, it is Facebook, and that's just because organically we we have gotten quite a bit of exposure on there and a larger audience. I think we're we're coming up on 10,000 Facebook likes um, at this point, point. Um, and we are just now dabbling into some paid Facebook advertising. Um, but it's important to kind of know what you're doing with Facebook advertising before you start spending the money. We actually did bring on a marketing consultant to help us out with a lot of that. Um, and uh, he's done a, some really good work. We used to always uh, target all of our Facebook ads based off of interest. So we're just trying to reach people actually who weren't even, a, had never been aware of our company before and we're not seeing very good success with it. But what he's been able to do, some of you might be familiar with what they call a Facebook pixel. And it's just basically some code that they give you that you can embed on your website. And then you can remarket to that traffic that's coming to your website on Facebook. So a lot of us have been, it's called retargeting. A lot of us have been, we've seen this before. You go and visit uh, a larger a website for a larger company and then you're spending time on Facebook and you'll see an ad from that company. Well, that means you've been retargeted. So that's what the Facebook pixel, pixel does. It allows you to pixel um, that web visitor and then run an ad to them later on in Facebook. And that has converted a lot better than just targeting interest for us. So that's a little bit of what we're doing with Facebook. We really haven't, you know, really dove into any of the other platforms. We do have a Twitter and Facebook page and 
no one's, sadly to say, no one's paying a lot of attention to those. We should be doing a better job. All that stuff helps, um, but we do put, you know, the highest priority on email for sure. Yeah, Brooks, I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse, but Eric's got a question about um, what kind of forages are primarily on your pastures out there in Roanoke. Oh, Oh yeah, that's um that's the hat that is the furthest away from me probably um, when we start talking about land land management and soil health. Um, my oldest brother uh, Blake, all of our names are really similar, so it's hard to keep us um, um, aligned. Um, but um, he's he oversees all of our um, our our beef enterprise and he oversees our our pork enterprise, um, and that's. That's the hat he wears, and um, I cannot speak uh, to that one actually much at all. Yeah. But, you know, that's what's been really good about having a family business and getting more of us involved is we can all spend focus and time at, you know, the aspects of having this operation that we truly enjoy and we don't have to do it all. Um, so it's really been nice to kind of bounce off of, you know, what people really have a passion for doing. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, at one point where your older brothers were like, like, hey, Brooks, you need to go into marketing because that's what we need. Was there any, was there any <laughs> conversation like that with the older brothers or with your folks? Because you guys all you know, seem not, to not, as well. Yeah, you know, not quite. My brother, again, my brother, older brother Blaine is the one who really dove into that. And he's the one who's had... Um, a lot of passion for it and he's done an incredible job of in fact he's he had grown quite a bit of our buying club base before I was even involved in in the farm full-time out of high school so I, I've almost had a little bit of inspiration under that to kind of come up with um, up under what he's doing um, in that in different ways um, but yeah no not not quite we've never really uh, tried to steer anyone to to one enterprise or the other which has worked out well. So everyone's kind of been able to kind of find and try out different things, see what they enjoy, what they really like. Two of my brothers are in the, uh, the Lane Hen Enterprise. Um, they share two different flocks and they've, you know, split costs on the, on the uh, processing equipment and all the overheads there. And that's their focus. They are very much involved in making that a profitable enterprise. And they've done a really good job. That's actually our most profitable enterprise um, on the farm. So focus has, has, has been something that's really helped us out. Brooks, one more question along, along those lines. With the, the, the family, did you say there were 10 full-time employees? So maybe there's a few non-brothers involved as well? Yeah, um, it's actually probably closer to 11, and uh, we're hiring, actually, if anybody knows of someone who uh, is, is good at customer service and likes to spend time in an office. Um, so we'll be up to 12, 12 full-time employees here, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, we've um, been fortunate to, with being seven brothers, um, we've been able to kind of hire in our social circle. So a lot of you know, long-term family friends are getting involved and now um, um, spending, um, hopefully, careers um, with us. And then there is quite a bit of part-time help. We have weekend drivers who take our buying club routes. The, um, you know, the egg guys have a lot of, a lot of high school help that come in to wash the eggs. So we're getting a lot more faces involved around here, which has been exciting. And actually, the youngest brother um, is still in high school. So we're going to do our best to make sure he stays involved, too. Um, uh, once it's all said and done, but uh, um, but yeah, so it has it has been nice to get other folks folks involved in what we're doing. That's really great. Um, it looks like we've uh, gotten through everyone's questions in the chat box. I don't see anything else rolling in here, so maybe this is a good time to to wrap it up. Um, so I'll say first of all, thanks to everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, but Brooks. Huge thanks to you for taking the time to, to share with us all of this information. This was a ton of good, really helpful, really practical information that um, our Practical Farmers of Iowa members really appreciate, I'm sure. So um, thanks a lot, and I hope we stay in touch. We're, we're going to keep an eye on you guys. You guys are doing great stuff. Hey, hey, well, hey, thanks for Frank, thanks for asking me to tune in. I really enjoyed, um, um, a lot of us enjoy kind of sharing the story. 
um, and learning from other folks uh, folks as well. So thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, let me know if, if you do. Again, I posted that email there, so if you guys have follow-ups, just let me let me know. Feel free to reach out. Cool. Yeah, one last plug to, you know, take that survey for PFI real quick. Let us know what you want to hear about in the future. Um, we're signing off tonight after this farminar, and we won't be back till November, but let us know what you want to hear about, and we'll put it on our radar. Um, so thanks a lot, Brooks. We really appreciate you sharing everything with us tonight. You bet. Thanks again, Steve, for asking me part of